It's great to be with you all. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm the director of the Centennial Institute here at Colorado Christian University, and we're so grateful you're joining us this evening. Just a few announcements. I'm going to turn it over to our real host for the evening. Uh, if you have never been to the Western Conservative Summit, I hope you'll join us. Uh, this year's Western Conservative Summit is June 3rd and 4th. We're going to be hosting it at the Gaylord Rockies, a beautiful facility out near Denver International Airport. The Western Conservative Summit is the one of the largest annual gathering of conservatives in the Western United States. Really a fantastic event. Uh, 40 to 50 speakers, renowned speakers from across the country, 2,300 attendees on average, 60 exhibitors, lots of workshops as we gather to focus on some of the most pressing issues facing our nation. So tickets are now available. If you go to westernconservativesummit.com, you can get your tickets there, but be sure to join us. It is a wonderful, fun rally on the right uh, for our conservative values. Tonight's event is titled Thriving Children in Thriving Communities, and we're very excited to be hosting Mr. Ian Rowe from the American Enterprise Institute. But as always, to begin our evening, we start with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. So please welcome CCU students Rivers Norquist and Damon Sider. I almost forgot. <laughs> uh, if you bow your heads with me this Dear Lord, thank you for this day. We just ask that um, you allow us to open our ears tonight to be able to hear um, a good, a good uh, interview tonight. Um, and thank you for allowing us to host um, Mr. Ian Rowe, um, that we will be able to take with us not only um, how we can be better politically, uh, but better grow your kingdom. Uh, so we thank you for allowing us to host this event, for being able to do these kind of things at a college university, God. And so just thank you for that. We praise you in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. And then if you would all stand with me really quickly, we'll do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. To kick off our evening, please welcome... Strategic Communications Major, Taylor Shirk. Mr. Ian Rowe is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation, and adoption. Mr. Rowe is also the co-founder of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools opening in Bronx 2022. The chairman of the board of Spence Chapin, a nonprofit adoption services organization, and the co-founder of the National Summer School Initiative. He concurrently serves as a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and a writer for the 1776 Unites campaign. Mr. Rowe has been widely published in the Polar Press, including in the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Examiner. Until July 1st, 2020, Mr. Rowe was the CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of public charter schools based in South Bronx and Lower East Side of Manhattan with an MBA from Harvard Business School and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science and Engineering from Cornell University and a Diploma in, Electoral, in Electrical Engineering from Brooklyn Technical High School, Ian Rowe seeks to inspire young people of all races to build strong families and become masters of their own destiny. So would you please help me welcome Dr. Ian Rowe and Dr. Copeland.
Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome again to uh, the campus of CCU. Glad to see uh, so many of our, our students here, and I know there are a lot who are also watching online, so, so welcome. Um, throughout the evening, uh, if you'd like to uh, prepare a question, uh, some of our uh, students will be coming up and down the aisles with uh, note cards, and so if you'd like to ask a question, we just ask you to, uh, to, to make a note of that, and we'll bring them up here, and we'll add them to our Q&A time. Well, um, Ian, it was great getting to know you a little bit this afternoon. Same here. And uh, had a chance to talk with some folks who are uh, interested in school choice here in Colorado. Had dinner with some CCU students tonight. And um, so I wondered if you would just start by telling us part of your story, but maybe in particular some of the formative experiences or events that kind of put you on the track of all these amazing things that <laughs> Taylor read in your, in your bio. Yeah, well, uh, well, first of all, great to uh, be with you this uh, evening, and thank you for the honor of speaking. And I have to say, I'm a mister, not a doctor. Um, uh, so, uh, well, in terms of, of formative uh, experiences, I think for most of us, uh, our formative experiences started with our parents, um, because that is the first institution and the, the first set of people who... Uh, love you fiercely and, and shape who you ultimately are. My, my parents uh, uh, came to this country from Jamaica, West Indies in the mid-1960s, uh, which was a very tumultuous time uh, in the United States, certainly as it relates to race relations. Um, uh, there were all sorts of protests and activities. Um, so my parents were quite clear what they were coming to. Uh, they weren't escaping from Jamaica but they felt that America was this place of opportunity. Uh, and my dad, uh, who was one of the first black engineers at IBM, and my mom uh, worked on Wall Street, um, they felt that this was a, a country that they could build a future for themselves and their two children. And uh, my uh, parents just always felt the most important thing was to be prepared for when opportunity ultimately came your way. And uh, so that meant for them, they had a strong belief that they wanted to uh, provide a strong family. My parents were married for 48 years before my dad uh, passed away, and they had a strong faith commitment, uh, and they believed in a very strong education. So with that grounding, that really allowed um, me to propel forward. As far as uh, a particular event that was formative, I shared this earlier with, with our dinner. Uh, when we first moved to the United States, we moved to Brooklyn. Um, and lived there for several years, and, uh, and then we moved on up to Queens. If, if uh, any of you are familiar with a television show called The Jeffersons, there's a funny thing about moving to Queens as a sign of sort of upward mobility. Uh, so we moved to a small town called Laurelton, Queens, a very small um, community, lovely. It had been a predominantly white town, mostly uh, Jewish, uh, mostly Italian, um, but it was slowly becoming more racially integrated. And unfortunately, that meant there were more negative racial incidents, especially in my junior high school that I was attending at the time. I was 12 years old. And it got so intense that the um, local school board decided to open an annex, a, a, an additional junior high school in Rosedale, which, is a, which was a town a couple of miles over, which was more predominantly and permanently white. Um, and so what started to happen is that all of the white parents in our junior high school took their kids out of our school and sent them to the annex in Rosedale. And my parents, who came to this country for the American dream under the assumption that the education would be better, you know, where the white kids were going, uh, were going to send me there as well. And I will always remember the Sunday night um, the, the, we, the transfer papers were due the next Monday, the, the following Monday, and my dad was sitting in his recliner where we, he always sat on Sunday nights, and my mom was on, on, on the sofa, and I was talking to my parents, and I begged them to stay, for me to stay in my school. You know, I had never challenged my parents <laughs> about anything. You know, my parents would crawl through broken glass for their two kids. And so I had never stood up to my parents, certainly on anything of this level of importance, but it just felt like this was different, that I didn't, 
like, why did my school have to be bad? I, I said, I love my school. I love my teachers. I really work hard just because it'll be a virtually black, you know, all black segregated school didn't mean that it had to be bad. Um, and I cried and I begged. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting how you remember these things, but I remember it as a seminal moment in my life. And they relented and they said yes to let me stay. And, you know, I went on to go to Brooklyn Tech and Cornell and all da 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 da. And so, you know, things turned out okay. But I think then, in that moment, when they said yes, I realized that I could influence my destiny. You know, I, I, I experienced what then I would have never described as something called agency, which we're going to talk about. But this belief that, that if something's really important enough, I can fight for it and I can make a difference. And it also influenced my thinking about institutions that just because the, a, a certain makeup of an institution is a certain way doesn't mean inherently that it's inherently better or inherently worse. That your expectations of excellence, your expectations to do great things should permeate uh, regardless of the makeup of that institution. And again, we'll talk about it in this conversation. But those, those, those lessons were very, very important um, as I grew up. And I started to realize, I guess, my own power in the world when there's something important enough to fight for. Well, and you mentioned uh, earlier, too, that, uh, you know, after you got into the business world, you're doing uh, computer science work and so on, you got interested in education. And maybe that would be another thing maybe to, to, to tell yeah. us about. Yeah, so, so first of all, I had a great K-12 public education in New York City. I went to Brooklyn Tech, which is one of the, what's called a specialized high school. Um, I majored in electrical engineering. So in Brooklyn Tech, there are actually 14 majors that you could choose from, architecture, electrical engineering, um, drafting. It was, it was actually pretty amazing. So I, was, uh, so I had a fantastic education. I then went to uh, study um, computer science engineering at Cornell University. That was amazing, and I then uh, went to, after I finished um, Cornell, I went to work for a company which was then called Arthur Anderson. Um, then it turned into Anderson Consulting, and now it's Accenture, uh, just to give you a sense of how many years ago this was. Um, and I did that for six years, and I was on track to become a partner at Anderson, and you know, I, I could have, I certainly could have um, made my path that way. And, uh, but while I was working at Anderson, I was also volunteering in public schools. In fact, I went back to uh, the elementary schools that, that, we, that I went to, and also the junior high school where all these issues were. And unfortunately, that junior high school, you know, despite some of my parents' uh, concerns, actually did turn out to be, it turned out to go in a very negative direction. I was mentoring kids in these schools. And it, it just seemed by accident of zip code, by accident of potentially the family structure that they were raised in, the prospects of their life were limited. And I, I was no more talented than they. I just happened to be born into a family that was very stable, with a faith commitment, with a great commitment to education, and that made all the difference for me. And here were these kids who had equal capacity, but it was being unrealized. And so as I was thinking about do I stay on this path of becoming a partner at you know, Anderson, which many of you students, you, you'll face these choices in your life of, I can do the expected thing, I can do the thing that might make me more money, I might do the thing that my parents will be proud of me if I do it, but it doesn't feel right. Well, that's how I was feeling. Um, that here I was on this path to, you know, again, a wonderful life, becoming a partner, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I felt that there was something else that I had the potential to do to work with kids. I didn't quite know what that meant yet. So I wanted to give myself two years to kind of step back. Um, I was good at strategy. I was, good, I was interested in business. And so I actually applied to business school. I went, ended up going to Harvard Business School. Um, and I spent two years there, learned a lot about myself. I started writing for the school newspaper. Long story, I met this uh, woman whose name is Wendy Kopp, if that name sounds familiar. Wendy founded an organization called Teach for America. Anyone know what Teach for America is? Wow, that's amazing. 15, 20 years ago, everyone, every, all the young people would, would have raised their hand because that was sort of the cool thing 
to do to go teach for two years in an urban or rural public school across the country. Anyway, I was really um, inspired by that, so I did the crazy thing. I went to work for Teach for America in between my first and second year of Harvard Business School. Then I did the really crazy thing. I went to work for 25,000 bucks for Teach for America, a fledgling nonprofit, you know, coming out of Harvard, um, didn't make my accountant happy. But the thing is, when you go to a great institution like this one, right, when you go to Colorado Christian, instead of being constrained by the education that you've just received, you actually should feel liberated. Liberated to pursue your dreams, that course of action that you think could be most impactful. And that's what I felt when I left Harvard Business School, because you know what, if, I, if this didn't work out, you know, I could always get a real job, right? But I've never, I've never actually gone back to get the real job. I started down this path of doing things that I'm incredibly passionate about that I feel is very impactful, particularly to the next generation. And so that time at Teach for America, I, you know, I worked for TFA and we, we got teacher certification laws passed in different states across the country to make it possible for people who had backgrounds in engineering or science who essentially had been banned because of certification laws could now be enter the classroom and take advantage of those skill sets. Um, from there, I started my own um, company working with nonprofits and governments of how to raise issues. 9-11 um, then occurred. Again, all these are long stories, but I had the opportunity to go work at the White House. So I worked at the White House uh, for 18 months, helped lead something called USA Freedom Corps, which was the president's initiative to mobilize all Americans to commit two years of their life in service to others. It was an amazing, amazing time. Again, long story, but after that, I then went to work for MTV, um, where I ran all of what's called pro-social programming. So if you're familiar with campaigns like Rock the Vote, or Choose or Lose, or Fight for Your Rights, or the One Campaign with Bono, like I ran those, and this were literally 100 million young people across the world trying to get them to take the passions that they had and do work in the real world to make things better for kids around the world. So that was amazing. Then I went to work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And all of this, there was a sort of, I was hurtling towards education as my thing. Um, uh, I went to work for the Gates Foundation for Bill and Melinda Gates. We gave away $470 million in one year as a pilot to, like, to figure out how to spend the real money, right? Um, but it was all about how do you improve outcomes for low-income kids, and we were giving tons of money at the high school level and at the college level, and frankly, we were basically giving money to help these organizations better remediate kids that were coming into high school and college already woefully behind in terms of academics, culture, social preparation. And so I just started to realize that we were starting way too late and that if I was gonna have an impact, I wanted to run my own institution of schools and I wanted to start earlier. And that's when I became CEO of Public Prep in 2010. It's a network, back then it was just one school, um, but elementary and middle schools, all girls and all boys. And, um, and I made a 10 year commitment, ran it for 10 years. We, you know, we built it into six campuses, um, 2000, more than 2000 students, 5,000 kids on our wait list um, each year you know, brutal. Um, it's an amazing thing to, when you run a random lottery, that's how kids get into charter schools because the demand is so high. It's an amazing thing to call a couple hundred families to say, you've got the golden ticket, your child got into our school. And then you have to send nearly 5,000 notes to families to say the best we can do is put your child on this excruciatingly long wait list. And it just became clear to me that there's all this talent but opportunity is not evenly, it's not evenly available. And so I fight for the opportunity for kids to have access, for equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. You can't guarantee that. And we can talk about the fight for equity in, you know, in, the, in present day. But much of my work now is how to have kids have better access to education, how to have ac access to better, stronger families, um, stronger faith commitment. Again, we'll talk about all of these things. But so. My interest in education is actually really just one piece of a larger effort to understand what are all the factors that really drive whether or not the rising generation will be successful or not. 
Well, so that leads us into the, maybe the first of my bigger questions on education, and that's kind of what is wrong with American schools? Now, I know it's a big question, it's a loaded question, but um, what's your diagnosis of what's wrong with American schools? Wow, so that's interesting. So I, um, my, my general orientation on questions like this is to always start with what is right about American schools. Because I actually feel that much of our um, mindset in our country is sort of a deficit mindset. We, we see the issues, we see the problems, and we immediately try to diagnose, you know, why are things not working? And what's interesting about that approach is that when you diagnose a problem from the negative, you are only looking for causality for why things aren't working the way that you do. It's a very different approach if you say, well, in those areas that's working, what is it that exists? So it's a, it's a, it's a difference between thinking, what, is the, what, what, are the pre, you know, what are the things that are present in institutions that are consistently successful, as opposed to what are the factors that drive negative outcomes? Those are two very different questions. So in those areas where you see really great success in schools, you typically see institutions that have incredible relationships with families, where families are generally stable, um, where you generally have more married two-parent households, or if you have single-parent households, those parents are extremely engaged as well. You usually see an environment where parents have chosen their child to go to that school, right? As opposed to a government school where you're basically slotted in based on your zip code. You usually see institutions or schools that have very high expectations in terms of academics. You also see um, communities where there's a high level of a faith commitment too. There's a great book that just came out maybe a month ago called um, God, Grades, and Graduation which is a really fantastic book that analyzes the role that a faith commitment can have in improving academic outcomes for kids. So, so, and, and so, so here, listen to the things I just named. Strong families, school choice, faith commitment, high expectations, those are the ingredients that usually dictate what's right with schools. Now, if I started the thing about, well, what's wrong with schools, you'd usually, well, the schools are racist or they're not funded enough. You would go down this litany and almost never hit any of the things that I just described and we get into this vortex where we're talking about factors that aren't really the ingredients of success. So those ingredients of success are a big part of your new book yes. called Agency, yes. um, which uh, you can go to Amazon and find it is forthcoming in the next month or May two. May 16th. Um, so you're welcome to go, uh, go look for that. So you, there's sort of a formula th that you're talking about in that book. You talk about the, the different areas that are, that are yeah. essential. Yeah. So, you know, in my work with young people, um, and I've been very fortunate to work with kids of all races, all backgrounds, um, and I do, I do see sort of two meta-narratives that I find young people are trapped in. Um, the first meta-narrative I call blame the system, and the other meta-narrative I call blame the victim. In the, in the blame the system narrative, that's a view of America, which is that America is this permanently oppressive country, that based on your race, your class, your gender, you're either a marginalizer or you're marginalized. You're either an oppressor you're, you're, or you're oppressed. Like the systems themselves are inherently evil. Capitalism itself is evil. You know, there's a white supremacist lurking on every corner. That the systems are so discriminatory that you as an individual are powerless to overcome unless there's a massive government intervention or societal transformation, right? So that's, that's blame the system and when we talk about things like critical race theory or, or a lot of applications of DEI or equity or anti-racism, those are very much steeped in this kind of the system itself is, is flawed and rigged against you. The blame the victim narrative is almost the opposite, which is that, no, 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 no. America is this amazing country. 
It's, it's a land of opportunity. The streets are paved with gold, right? If you're not successful, it's your fault, right? It's something that you haven't done to take advantage of these opportunities. It's some pathology that you have. You should have pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. Looks, lots of other people have done it. Why didn't you? And so both of these narratives, I say, are half-truths that add up to a lie. They're very debilitating for young people because, in a sense, they rob you of agency. They rob you of this belief that you can actually control your own destiny. And so I always think it's important as we think about why aren't things working, A, where are things working, and then what's your compelling and empowering alternative? So I have put forth a new framework that I believe is my sort of counter proposal to these two big meta narratives because I think it's important that young people today and the young people I mean sort of rising generation like many of the people in this room who are 24 and under who are still sort of sense making and that you need a new framework to know that you do have the ability to overcome the institutional barriers that the blame the system people are saying are insurmountable, while simultaneously letting you know that there are institutions that can support you that are so necessary, and it's what the blame the victim people constantly ignore. They ignore the importance of institutions. And so the framework I'm putting forth, I call free. Family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. Family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. Because those are the four pillars that in my view, if more young people embrace the power of those four institutions, your likelihood of leading a, a prosperous life would be dramatically higher. So family is not the family that you're from, it's the family that you form. So there's great data. How, how many people have ever heard a term called the success sequence? All right, one or two. Because <laughs> we, sat, we sat earlier this evening. Um, so the success sequence is just a series of decisions. Um, if you are a young person and you finish just your high school degree, and then you get a full-time job of any kind, just so you learn the dignity and discipline of work, and if you have children, marriage first, that series of decisions, uh, evidence shows 97% of the time you avoid poverty and you are much more likely to be in the middle class or beyond. That's an incredible set of data that most young people don't know. And it's, in, it's information that we're gonna be teaching in our school, not in a prescriptive fashion. The, the goal isn't to say you must live your life in this way, but it's descriptive. So imagine being in like a probabilities class where you're learning about the different series of decisions you can make as you make your passageway into young adulthood. Well, this pathway yields 97% avoidance of poverty. This pathway yields only 3% avoidance of poverty. And you make your own decision. So that's an element of why family um, in this framework is so important because it's about not whatever history you may have, you're not trapped by your history, very, very important. And that all of these levers are the things that give you power in your own life. So the R is about religion, having a personal faith commitment, whether it's Christianity, Buddhism, almost doesn't matter. But at a time when our religiosity is in decline, the importance of a personal faith commit commitment is actually increasing. And there's tons of evidence that shows that People that have that are not just gain strength from the belief, they gain strength from the community that they become part of. And this becomes, I think, extremely important today because the, 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 the natural yearning for a spiritual belief in some ways is actually being filled. John McWhorter, who's a great author, has a book called Woke Racism where he compares anti-racism and critical race theory ideology almost like a religion unto itself. Like you can be excommunicated if you don't absolutely believe every single tenet of these, these ideologies. And so you can't substitute, these substitute religions 
don't add up for a true faith commitment. So that's R. E is about education, which is, uh, it's all about having school choice and the ability to pursue a great education. So those 5,000 kids that are in the South Bronx that are on the wait list, they, ha they actually have a choice. You know, they actually are given a shot. It's very difficult to get on the first rung of upward mobility if you're going to a school, like for example, in the South Bronx, where only 2% of kids are graduating from high school ready for college, right? That's, that's criminal. Um, and then the very last E is for entrepreneurship. So if you've got strength of family, religion, personal faith commitment, strong educational choice, that last E is about entrepreneurship, which includes work, but it also includes understanding how you build your own wealth, right? How do you problem solve? In the, in the network of high schools that we're launching in the Bronx uh, this August, all incoming ninth graders uh, through a partnership with Charles Schwab through their stock slices program, it's called Fractional Shares, where for $5, you can own a piece of Apple or Walmart or Google. Every ninth grader is gonna have a stock portfolio of 10 S&P 500 stocks. So that, you know, if they've got an iPhone and they buy Apple, they're not just a consumer, they're an owner. And what does that mean? What does it mean to, have, to un be an owner of a company and understand, wow, someone created this and I have value in it. And every quarter I'll be able to see with my friends, like. <laughs> your portfolio is paying dividends. Your earnings are up. Mine are down. Why is that? It's one of the little things that we're going to do to help our kids build this, this uh, future orientation, this idea that they can become owners. So, that's, so I'm putting forth this framework as, in my view, a compelling alternative and counterpoint to blame the system and blame the victim as inherently debilitating narratives where I think this idea of free family, religion, education, entrepreneurship can be the pillars and the pathways through which young people can find their own sense of agency and pursue the American dream. On that idea of family, certainly just the, the validity of marriage itself is one of the key questions. And we don't want another government program. We've already got a nanny state. We don't need a, like a marriage state. No one wants match.gov, right? Um, <laughs> But, I like that. But how, but how do we encourage healthy marriages? Well, we don't uh, do what happened last night on the Academy Awards where, 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 where we're slapping. Um, uh, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question because there's only so much government can do, right? And there have been lots of government initiatives to try and spur marriage. Um, but when it comes to very intimate decisions, um, it's very unlikely you're gonna trust some bureaucrat in Washington or Albany, in my case, to believe that what they're deciding for your life is better. Notice, free did not include a G. <laughs> you know, it's not that government is unimportant or policy, but that's, that's, not, where, that's not where moral formation comes from. So the, the reason um, I've put, put forth this framework, family, religion, education, entrepreneurship, is that, again, no matter what your, the structure or the stability or instability of the family that you were raised in, you have the power to create something stable and beautiful for yourself. And the ways in which, and so first of all, you've got to know about these things. That's why we should teach things like the success sequence in schools. Religious organizations, there is a great correlation between a personal faith commitment and marriage. There just is. And, and so that's where the level of influence comes from. In education, I think we should be teaching not necessarily a specific religion, but we should be teaching about the power of having a faith commitment and what that could mean in one's life. It doesn't mean it's always a guarantee. Um, and so we can look at campaigns, for example, that have helped uh, young people in particular think about intimate decision making. In my book, Agency, I do look at something called um, the national campaign to prevent teen pregnancy. There was a period of time where teen pregnancy, there was more than a million teen pregnancies in the United States everywhere, every year is skyrocketing. And there was a campaign that engaged religious leaders, Hollywood, the entertainment sector, cultural influencers to shift the way that young people made these very intimate decisions. And so I do think there are lessons learned about how you can uh, create um, 
campaigns in this arena. Final point, there's a group called, uh, it, was, it was called the Culture of Freedom Initiative several years ago that decided it wanted to increase marriage rates. Uh, but they couldn't do that on some national campaigns, so they chose three localities. Um, I think one in Florida, one in Arizona, I forget the other. Um, but they built relationships with churches where uh, churches had uh, information about their congregants and they started building data where they could share with a pastor, here are uh, families who are young families who are having children or other families because of counseling. They could almost, um, through predictive anal an analytics, help pastors sense which families or which marriages might actually be in trouble. And so they organized date nights and other activities and in one particular locality, the divorce rate went down significantly. And so that, the success of that has now translated into the creation of an organization called Communio, where they're trying to mobilize churches across the country to become much more engaged locally in strengthening marriages. So I think how we um, create more of a courtship culture, again, for many um, kids in this room, uh, years ago, you used to meet your mate through your family, your friends, through your church, maybe through work. Now you're meeting friends through, you know, your mates through Match.com. Relationships are much more transactional. Courtship culture, you know, pornography. Like there's a lot that's impeding the ability of young people to have, to form healthy relationships. It's actually, it's, it's actually for my view, it's one of the, the most dangerous um, elements of growing up today. Just the ability to build a healthy relationship. And again, these are things that we talk about in our schools. It's not just about sex or anything, just how do you form respectful, trusting relationships? Um, because I think a lot of young people are not getting that sort of, um, that kind of healthy grooming that we may have gotten in prior generations. So another question on, on entrepreneurship. Uh, a couple of weeks ago here on the stage, we had a debate at CCU on the question of reparations and whether those might be you know, some helpful element in, in solving some of our uh, racial animosity. And one of the speakers pointed out that you know, there's this wealth gap between uh, the average black family and the average white family. But you testified before Congress recently that there's some sur surprising numbers inside those numbers. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. It's a, it's a very, um, so for some people, when they are looking at, um, it's, it's actually similar to the question of what's wrong with American schools? It's like, well, why is there a racial wealth gap? And if you frame it from the negative, you will find the data that reinforces your worldview, right? So in the case of the racial wealth gap, the 2019 survey of consumer finances is often the data point that's, that's used to share the numbers. And if you look solely at that data, that study, the median wealth of the average white family, if you're looking at race alone, is about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average black family. If you're looking solely at race, no other factors. Um, and so for some people they say, that's it. That's the proof, that's the proof of America's history of racial oppression. It's the proof of America's contemporary um, uh, racial oppression. And the gap is so huge that there's nothing a black person can do to overcome that outcome. In fact, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's the architect of um, uh, the, the 1619 project for the New York Times, wrote an 8,000 word essay in the New York Times Sunday Magazine called What We Are Owed. And in that essay, she argues that there's no other solution for, the black, for black people in this country other than a $13 trillion reparations program, right? Because there's nothing you can do. And in fact, she even says, quote, there's the, what black people are expected to do, it doesn't matter if you get married, doesn't matter if you get educated, doesn't matter if you buy a home, doesn't matter if you save. None of those things can overcome 400 years of racialized plundering, end quote. Like, imagine if you were a 12-year-old black kid and you hear that. Like, I mean, that sounds pretty hopeless. And yet, ironically, Nicole Hannah-Jones, 
has done all of those things in her life, and she leads a quite prosperous life. And she's not the only one. There are millions of black Americans and people of all races who've done all of those things. So if you look at that exact uh, 2019 survey of consumer finances, when you take into account just two other factors, the situation is very different. The median wealth of the average married, college-educated black family is about $220,000 on an absolute basis. It's about $160,000 more than the median wealth of the average white single parent family. So why is that important? Well, it says that maybe we need to dive a bit deeper into this thing called the racial wealth gap, and perhaps there are factors beyond just race that make a difference as to whether or not you can lead a prosperous life. So when we continue to send this message to kids of any race that, well, your race is determinative, you have lost agency. You've lost, you, you've just lost the ability to believe that anything that you do makes a difference. There must be some external party that has to come to your rescue. So the argument for reparations, I find a very weak one. First of all, there's very little evidence that shows when you just shower money onto people, particularly government money, with no strings attached, that usually leads to all sorts of unintended and negative consequences. And we've got, you know, 22 children, $22 trillion of the war on poverty as a lot of evidence to back up that statement. But more importantly, if you don't only ask the question, well, why, are there, why is there such a race, racial wealth gap, as opposed to the asking the question, wow, there's this thriving black middle class. What is it that's allowing this group to succeed or, or any other group of people? And generally, the things that you find, usually they had access to high quality education, usually married two parent households, usually a faith commitment. You know, that's the deal. That, you know, so we, we obsess over failure without being relentless about studying success. And I often find that that's where we, we lose sight in these, in these public debates of how we move forward as a country. Um, we want to focus on disparities and what's wrong, completely ignoring the progress and success that exists in lots of communities and really understanding what those factors are. Well, so reparations are a you know, fairly popular new idea, relatively new uh, in many ways, at least in the popular imagination, but affirmative action has been around for a much longer time. So let me ask the question in a different way than I would usually, what's right about affirmative action and what's wrong about it? So uh, again, fair question. I, I just did a, a New York Times debate on race-based affirmative action, and I actually, my argument was that it should come to an end, um, partly because Race-based affirmative action has been around now since the mid-1960s, and one cannot argue that there has been a dramatic increase in the uh, presence of students of color in schools of higher education. There are millions of black kids, for example, uh, not, to mention, not to mention Asian, Hispanic, um, uh, kids that are going to college. And, and, and even you know, the first affirmative action case, really the biggest one was the Bakke case in California back in the late 60s, um, really established the right for colleges to use race as a factor in uh, acceptance. And then about 25 years after that, there was a case in, again, Michigan Law School where I think a white uh, female law student sued to say that her uh, slot was rejected because of the school's affirmative action policy. And the Supreme Court actually did side with the school at that point, but Sandra Day O'Connor said, you know what, we're, we're judging this case this way, but 25 years from now, we should no longer need race-based affirmative action. Well, guess what, we're almost coming up to the 25th anniversary, and there is a case right now at Harvard where a deep analysis has been done to show that if you look at Harvard's um, admissions policies, they have clearly been discriminating against Asian students in favor of black students. And when you look at the um, demographics of black students that are actually um, accepted through race-based affirmative action, the vast majority of those students are either recent immigrants from you know, uh, either wealthy or certainly middle or higher income families, 
or they're native born, but they're still upper class in, in the sense of the, the, the black kids who are benefiting from affirmative action are not necessarily the kids who were originally thought about when affirmative action was originally conceived. So in a sense, we should declare victory and end it. And if affirmative action is to exist, now make it economically based, make it class-based, because there, there, there are far more um, poor kids of all races that deserve an opportunity to have access to an incredible um, higher education uh, experience versus making the assumption that race alone is an in inherent disadvantage, which is what race-based affirmative action would perpetuate. So my belief is what's right about race-based affirmative, uh, one can argue, and, and by the way, there have been some trade-offs because every black person who has been successful has dealt with the, the perception that, wait a minute, are you here because you're black or you're really talented? Did you get, you know, so that, 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 you know, it, that is also part of the legacy of race-based affirmative action, but one can't deny it has had an impact on creating open doors, but now assuming race is a liability is a falsehood, and that class and economic status is a far greater barrier for kids of all races, so I would posit that we should replace class-based affirmative action with, or replace race-based affirmative action with uh, class-based or economics. Okay. I want to kind of rewind for, for a minute, way back to the beginning, to your conversation about you know, your, your story and so on. Just tell us a little bit more about the charter schools, all boys school, all girls schools, and so on, and, and this new project that you're, yeah. that you're involved in. Yeah, so, as, you know, as I described my career, you know, incredible opportunities at MTV and the Gates Foundation. You know, I was raising money for um, schools. I was... Um, giving away money, it was creating television shows that highlighted great schools across the country. But it just became clear to me that I didn't really understand what was going on in schools on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, what are the real challenges? Like, a lot of us talk about school, or the, the last time we were actually in a school was when, like, we were in school <laughs> in, in 12th grade. Um, but what is it like to go to schools today? Like, what is it like to go to a, a school in the heart of the South Bronx, where only 2% are graduating from high school ready for college? What is that like, you know? And I felt that I wouldn't uh, be being honest with myself if I were really saying that I'm focused on improving outcomes for kids if I didn't take the leap and run schools myself. Like, you know, I, I am a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. It's an incredible platform. You know, I'm, I'm doing a congressional hearing on Thursday to talk about education. So I do a lot of policy work. Um, you know, a lot of theory, but there's nothing like asking the question, well, how does that theory work on 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, <laughs> right? When you have to put ideas in front of real people, that it's not a spreadsheet, it's like, are these ideas around curriculum or high expectations, do they really work? So that's why I decided to um, become the CEO of Public Prep, it's an amazing experience. And you just realize that these are just kids and families who you know, they're not thinking about DEI, they're not thinking about anti-racist training, they want their kids to know math really well, right? They want their kids to know science really well. They want their kids to have opportunities to come to schools like this. They want to even know that schools like this exist, right? And, and I just realized that a lot of the chatter, the elites that are often speaking on behalf, particularly of low-income kids, have no idea what's going on in the lives of low-income kids. And the ideas that they have are counter. You know, so, for example, school choice. There are many, quote unquote, elites that will send their kids to private schools or they'll move to the suburbs or move to great neighborhoods so their kids can attend great public or private schools, right? And they'll be the first person in line to say, you can't open a charter school because somehow that'll you know, that'll destroy the public school system, right? Meanwhile, you know what? Come with me to the South Bronx. I want you to sit with me with a 24-year-old single mom who, whatever decisions she may have made in her own life, her five-year-old, she wants that kid to go to a great school. Not a school where only 2% of kids are graduating from high school ready for college. I want you 
with your luxury beliefs, to sit with this young woman and tell her that she doesn't deserve the same choice that you have in your own life, and that you are sitting high and mighty depriving her of this choice. That's the stuff that makes me really angry. <laughs> um, and, but I, channel, I channel that anger into building institutions that embody the principles that I think um, our kids need. And so I ran public prep for 10 years, and that was schools through eighth grade. But in places like New York City and like all over the country, you can do great work through eighth grade, but then they're in the abyss in the high school selection process. So I'm now going back in. I'm launching a new network of character-based international baccalaureate high schools. And they'll be grounded in the principles of equality of opportunity, individual dignity, and our common humanity. Right? Those are, those are, those are anchors. It's not equity. It's not about DEI. It's, rec it's recognizing each, the inherent dignity of each individual child. We're organizing our curriculum around the four cardinal virtues, courage, justice, wisdom, temperance. You know, courage is I reject victimhood. There are no victims in our school. And we're not gonna allow other people to tell you that you're a victim because of your race or your skin color or whatever, right? And this is the armor that I think young people need to build, but they can't do it alone, right? So free, is about the institutions that we need to do our jobs as well. Like the, the seven-year-old kid who's growing up in the South Bronx or in Chicago or Appalachia, or wherever, they don't have the unilateral capability to create more charter schools, right? So the institutions, ha we have to do our job to give kids a shot. So that's what I'm you know, doing, that's why I'm, I'm doing our work, and, and, but it's not easy. I mean, literally right now, the teachers union has filed a lawsuit a baseless lawsuit against our schools. We're gonna win, but it just reminds you that the status quo is the status quo for a reason. There are institutions that are invested in keeping things the same way, even if their rhetoric is that we wanna help create opportunities for kids, but their actions are actually stifling those opportunities. So for uh, many in our audience who are you know, aspiring teachers and so on, Say a word more about the, the role of teachers' unions and the, the institutions that, they're, uh, that, they, that they control. Well, teachers' unions are not the same as teachers. It's really important. Um, uh, the teachers' union, by definition, are a representative body that represent the labor interests of, of their constituents. It's not explicitly connected to outcomes for students. And unfortunately, sometimes those two things clash. And um, you know, you may have situations where you know a teacher contract, which can be you know literally, you know, almost six inches thick of all these regulations. Like you can't, you know, you can work from 7:59 p.m. to 2:23, and not one minute after, and and all these things which are artificial constraints on excellence. And so, like at our schools, we, we're not unionized, and we recognize teachers are our most precious asset, along with principals. Because um, principals are important, you know, principals don't get enough attention. Because um, principals are the ones that help create great environments where teachers um, can flourish. And so we try to build compensation systems, professional development supports. You know, we're building a 100,000 square foot facility in the heart of the South Bronx to create an incredible working, in, working and learning environment for our students and faculty. So teachers are the lifeblood. And so teacher unions, though, um, you know, you even saw it with COVID in these last couple of years where teachers union, it certainly appeared that they were an obstacle to getting schools back open, and I, and I think there were a lot of teachers who were probably ready um, to do the work, but the, the, certainly the narrative and the perception were that teachers union were not always uh, working uh, in the best interest of kids. Well, so from, uh, from teachers to parents, um, parents' rights are a hot topic again in the news, um, the battles over uh, critical race theory, 
transgenderism and so on in, in the schools. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about w what's happening with sort of the, the, uh, the broader movement in, uh, in concern for, for parents' rights? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think the, the, you sort of poke the tiger. <laughs> I think parents have been the tiger that, that have been poked <laughs> over the last couple of years. And that, you know, I, I think even though most American schools, I mean, only 37% of all American kids are reading at proficiency based on the nation's report cards. So these are very low numbers, right? But even so, most Americans still thought their local school was still operating okay. Well, all the other schools are bad, but my school's pretty good. Um, but with COVID, something very dramatic happened. Suddenly, parents had visibility into what literally is going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, either the schools weren't open, and you were going home with worksheets, and the parents are like, wait, I'm not, I, I, you know, I've got a day job. I can't just suddenly be the teacher. You know, or they were watching Zoom meetings where suddenly, you know, uh, kids are being taught things about sexuality that seemed inappropriate for first graders or second graders, or they were being told that they were an oppressor because, um, because of their skin color, um, or they were just, the level of rigor was not there, and suddenly parents had great visibility, and I think that has animated parents to recognize that school choice really matters. And so you've seen these dramatic numbers, increases in homeschooling, increases in religious, in Catholic schools in particular, increase in charter school um, in certain um, localities, and reductions in traditional public schools. And, I, and, and it didn't help that, you know, in Virginia, Governor uh, Youngkin and his competitor, whose name is uh, Terry McAuliffe, you know, he, he says, we don't listen to parents. Like, wait, what? You know, and so parents understandably said, no, look, schools are important, but we're their parents. You know, you can't usurp our role. And across the country, there has been this kind of encroachment where schools seem to be treading on parents' rights, whether that does have to do with um, transgender policies where, you know, kids may be being called one thing at school where literally the teacher, all the classmates, the principal, everybody in the school is calling the kid one thing, and the only person that doesn't know is the kid's parent. You know, after a while, parents are going to start to think, wait a minute, are you, am I, are you my ally in this or are you my enemy? And so those kinds of things, I think, have animated parents. So you've seen organizations pop up, you know, Parents Defending Education, you know, Moms, um, Moms of Liberty. Like, all these organizations are, have, in, in a true American spirit, like a true de Tocqueville spirit of when Americans see a problem, they associate, they, they form associations. It's actually been a great, we, we lament civics, We've actually seen a, an incredible civics revolution in terms of mobilization over the last few years, the creation of organizations like f the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism, even, even the, the network of schools I'm launching. Like all of this is in response to a movement within public schools that we don't like. And rather than shout in the rain or say that's a bad idea, how about we come up with a better idea that's compelling? And so I think parents um, are at the forefront of that movement. The question is, can it sustain itself? Will we sort of snap back where parents sort of get, get back into more of a reticent, you know, my school's fine, as opposed to, I think, the fire that is existing right now? Well, we talked earlier over dinner, too, about the, the differences among charter schools and where they're particularly where there are more opportunities for them, so large urban areas as opposed to rural areas and so on. Um, where are charter schools growing and where do they have room to grow yet? Well, that's a good question. You know, where are charter schools growing? Well, where, where, could, where could charter schools grow and they're not growing? So, for example, in New York City, um, there's a wait list of about 70,000 kids from primarily low-income communities across the Bronx, uh, Manhattan, parts of Queens, more of the uh, poorer parts of Brooklyn, and yet, if you had a great idea to launch a charter school in New York City right now, you couldn't. There's a cap. And why? Primarily because the teachers' union has such influence over elected officials, it has 
basically squashed the ability. And again, these were kids in districts where single digits, single digit percentages of kids are graduating from high school ready for college. And so we're all trying to fight that. Um, in those areas, I mean, we talked earlier about, um, you know, uh, your schools are open. You've got three opening next year, potentially a couple more the year after. So policy matters. Um, the the state, so f states like Florida, Texas, it looks like Colorado, they're generally still receptive to educational choice and innovation. New York State used to be that, but you know we have our battles um, ahead. In general, um, the charter, I mean, just two days ago, three days ago, the federal government uh, announced restrictions on something called the, the CSP program, the charter school plan, I think it's charter school planning grants, um, which were designed to facilitate growth within the sector. Well, the current Department of Education is placing all sorts of regulations, which basically will make it virtually impossible for innovative school leaders who want to launch great schools in communities where kids are desperate, desperate for great schools. And yet, the rules that are being created literally will stifle the ability for schools to be open. So those, that's one of the things I'm, I'll be um, speaking about on Thursday at this congressional hearing. Like, whatever the rhetoric is, look at the actions of the people who are claiming that they're doing good things for kids, because they're not. And, and I hope that someone like me, who's both a think tanker, um, but also someone who runs schools in the heart of the South Bronx, I can bring a level of credibility and integrity to this whole discussion. You talk about the importance of policy, and certainly that's one of the things that, you know, the, the focus of the Centennial Institute, and getting people motivated and engaged. Uh, you mentioned these new federal rules. There is a public comment period over the next couple of weeks where any American citizen can, can write in or call in and share their, their concerns with the, the legislation. Um, the state of Colorado has several dozen new education bills uh, up uh, this spring during the current session. And some of them de you know, definitely impact charters, other types of public schools, private schooling, uh, teacher training, teacher accountability, a whole range of things. And so it's, it's very important to stay on top of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, this, this is where the question of Will the fire that exists right now with parents continue to rage or die down? Because there was another um, competition that the U.S. Department of Education released, I think it was last year, around guidelines of history. And it basically was saying, in order to get access to these grants, they named like the New York Times 1619 Project as exam exemplar curricula to use. And here, this, is a, this is a literally a curricula which says, that the country wasn't even founded in 1776, that the, the country's founding principles were false when they were written, that America was a slaveocracy, not a, not a democracy, that anti-black racism runs in the very DNA of the country. Like, this is literally, and the US government was saying this is an exemplar. Well, tens of thousands of comments came in, a lot of that organized by a group called Parents Defending Education, because they, they were not gonna let this moment pass, and I, there was no question that those comments played a role in rolling back those grants. So yes, everyone's gotta get out, but this is where, will we just snap back to normal? Will everyone in this room hearing this go home, Google, and find that link and add a comment? Like, how, how many of you are you gonna do that when you go home? Right? Well, this is, the, this is it. Th this is, you know, I often talk about, um, when we talk about our country, like America is a good, if not great, country. But the distance between good and great is not a function of you sitting back and just observing whether or not that happens. The distance from good to great is paved by your action to do the minutia of going to a website to add a comment that says, that doesn't make sense to me. More schools need to have the ability to get these grants and provide more choice to kids in low-income communities. Otherwise, we won't go from good to great, right? It's re this is why I do the work that I do. Like, you're not some passive recipient of a country that just, that is just, that's a guarantee. It's not. And, you know, so my, my message to young people constantly is that 
you're not a victim. You're not just some passive player. You know, as, as, as Martin Luther King said, you're not just a jetsam or flotsam, you know, that floats on the river, you know, that stuff that you see that just, that's not who you are. Like, you're the current. And you have to own that. And so little things like that that seem tiny and minuscule are significant in strengthening the future of our country. So teachers to parents to school boards. And uh, last year, uh, you successfully ran and won uh, a seat on the Pelham School Board. Uh, talk a little bit about that camp campaign and why you did it and what are some of the things you've, you've found. Yeah, does the phrase glutton for punishment come to mind? Um, no, no, actually, I gotta say, I think my role on the school board in some ways is by far the most important thing I'm doing, as challenging as it sometimes is, because first of all, it's my own two children who are in the public school system. But, you know, um, a year and a half ago, the school district uh, decided to do something called an equity audit, where they basically hired this firm to come in and uh, do an analysis to essentially find out how, you know, uh, how racist our school system was. And guess what? This, this consultant found all sorts of ways that the, the school district had done harm to children. And I thought it was badly researched. To me, it was obvious. I mean, it was clearly conclusions had been drawn well before the analysis was even started. It was obvious to me, just looking, because I've seen a bunch of these equity audits. And so I decided to write a critique because you know, I testified to our school board, but it seemed like there was a, a speeding train that had, was already, this organization had been hired to continue to do more work. Um, and so I wrote this document, which in, in my view, very objectively said, here are the things that I think are wrong with this document, and here are the things I think that are right with our district. And, you know, we're a school of character of our middle school. We're doing amazing work in science and all these other areas. Let's understand success and build on that versus framing our entire district as a place that's harmful to certain groups of kids. And I believe the more that we study success, the more that outcomes will improve for everyone across the district. So I wrote this document and I posted it on the, and at first I shared it with the superintendent because um, it's very important that you, know, you, you share these things up front first. But then I, I posted it to the, the Parents of Pelham Facebook page so that the entire community could read this critique. And it was an amazing response. Thank you for writing this. I was thinking the same thing, but I was terrified to say any of this out loud. And you just realize there are all these folks, you know, that, that phrase, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Well, oftentimes I feel like there are people who, they know that what's happening in our country is wrong, but they're terrified to say anything. And just know that when you demonstrate courage, there will be hundreds of people who are thanking you for standing up for what's right. Know that in your heart. When things are difficult, there are lots of other people who are going to benefit. Even if they don't say it to you, know that your courage will spread. And so when I posted that, then that, of course, then led to other issues and other items. So I decided to run. And, um, and I, my entire campaign, equality of opportunity, individual dignity, our common humanity, and how do we align to a standard of excellence? And I won. And um, you know, alongside another gentleman who's amazing, who I think was also aligned, that was seeing that the, the district was going in a direction that academics weren't as prioritized as they should be. And I think and another election is coming up in about a month. And three seats are open. And I think there will be another referendum. Are academics at the core of what we do? You know, because. That's what we send our kids to school for. We, we certainly want to shape character and other things, other things and have them be empathetic citizens, but how are kids doing in science and reading and math and the arts? You know, those, you know, those subjects that we, uh, we want all our kids to do well in. And, um, but if you really want to know what's going on in your school system, run for school board. There is, uh, it's, it's brutal. You know, local politics, it's personal. Um, but you got to figure out ways to live with one another. Um, and, uh, wow. Wow. I don't know if that's moonlighting or... <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so yeah, so school board has been a really wonderful experience. It's a three-year term, incredible amount of work, but well worth it uh, if you're looking to really take your first step into what's going on in schools. Well, you told us a story earlier, too, about a, a situation where you could have engaged the culture war oh, yeah. head-on there, but you chose a different approach. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, when we first, so my term started July 1st of 2021, and one of the first things we did as a board was that we uh, did a walking tour of our new elementary school. Um, beautiful new building, it was, it was a, a, we had done a bond issue, it was a big achievement for the district that the school was opening. Really a great town effort. Um, and as the board is walking through, I saw a bathroom sign, um, and on the, in these single occupancy bathrooms, there was a sign, and it had sort of a stick image of a man, then a dividing line, then a stick image of a woman, and a dividing line, and then another human stick image, but this image had a half skirt and a half pant leg, and then also a disabled sign. So that was really interesting. So everything to the right of the dividing line was almost implying that there was a disability here. Maybe that's an unintended message, but that's what it was also sending. But I looked at that, because this was an elementary school, right? And I asked the, um, you know, one of the administrators, he said, oh yeah, yeah, that sign is in all of our elementary, there are four elementary schools, one middle school and one high school. And it's, oh yeah, that sign is in all of our schools. It's in all four elementaries, middle school, high school. And I looked at that and I thought, this was not appropriate, right? And, and, and again, I could have in that moment, you know, said all sorts of things about this is wrong, but I didn't in that moment. I saw it and then in between the time that we went back to uh, more of a private session, I had done some very quick research on what some empowering alternatives were. So when we got back, I asked my fellow board members, like, if a five-year-old in this school came up to you and asked you, what is, what is that sign? I, I, get, I get man, you know, I, I get woman, but what's half skirt, half pant leg? What would you say? And no one had a good answer. And, and we almost, they almost like said, yeah, I know, but we thought, you know, that was the only sign that was available. We thought that, you know, we just, like, it was, we thought it was okay. I'm like, but is it okay? And, and then I showed an alternative, which was a bathroom sign with just a toilet. Right? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, we can do that. And so that sign is now being has been replaced in all of the, the high school, the middle school, the gym, um, three of the four elementary schools, and in about three weeks, it'll be completely replaced in all of our schools. And, and it's, a, it's a tiny example, but it is a good example of how to, in my view, what could have been a very contentious issue, or suddenly we're gonna have huge arguments about bathroom signs and transgender and identity. It's like, no, we just, we found a compelling alternative. So that's another lesson I learned that in a lot of these difficult decisions, dis discussions, try not to demonize. Like the people who thought that that sign was okay aren't necessarily bad people. They were thinking, well, maybe I'm just being sensitive to kids who are you know, questioning their identity. Like, yeah, but we're also confusing a large population, the, uh, and, then, and that's not good either. And so a toilet actually achieves the objective without, you know, without going down that path. And so, so it was being able to have a civil discourse around what potentially could have been a contentious issue and to have an empowering alternative, something that people can say yes to as opposed to just trying to duke it out all the time. Do you think that's a particular challenge for conservatives in the way that we pose questions, like what's wrong with education as opposed to the empowering questions? Well, I do, I do, th I do think, you know, and, and I hate labels because, you know, what, what does it really mean? What does the word conservative mean? In some circles it's demonized, in others it's like it's hailed. You know, what does liberal mean? So I try to stay away from labels, but I do think folks who have, let's say, more center-right um, beliefs can benefit 
by demonstrating more empathy. So for example, let's talk about, because um, you know, I ran a network of all girls and all boys schools, right? So I had situations where we did have individual kids who experienced gender dysphoria, right? Who, who, who felt not comfortable in their own space. And that's a real thing. I don't think it, it's happening to the scale at which it's being portrayed now. But it does happen, and so when it does happen, you don't just dismiss it, you actually work with the child's parents, you figure out, you don't make any assumptions, you don't, you don't just inherently do, take on, like for example, a gender affirmation strategy, because that actually may be incredibly harmful. You have to dive deep and have a more empathetic, individualized, contextual approach with each child, because guess what? Each child is worthy of respect and for their individual, Dignity, and so to the degree that we can show that we have empathy, but we have different solutions for how we um, solve, you know, these kinds of issues. I think will be helpful. And the more that we focus on again success, you know, it's not, you know, why are schools bad or why is there a racial wealth gap? The question is, for the people that are successful, what is contributing to their success? That's a much more fruitful inspiring, optimistic, hopeful, solution-oriented conversation. And I think that general approach can be applied to almost every issue that we seem to be at odds on today. I want to uh, get some, uh, some questions, especially from our students. I don't know if we've got uh, the note cards ready to, to come around, but if you've got a question in mind, if you just flag down uh, Damon or someone and... Uh, and uh, no, make a note of your question. Um, I'll ask one or two to others um, as, as we're sort of waiting for some of those to come in. So tonight's audience includes a lot of students who are future educators. Um, what, uh, you know, what advice would you give them? Um, I guess particularly in terms of thinking about what kinds of schools they want to teach in, what kind of environments they want to be in, how to really impact kids. Wow. Um, well, this is a, it's a very personal question. I, I, you know, not every school is for everyone. So I run schools in the heart of the South Bronx, which are, um, you know, it, 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 it can be different for sure. Um, you can be uh, dealing with kids who have very different issues in their own lives. And even I'm sure um, here in Colorado, I mean, we were talking about, what was the town we were talking about um, that's close by where there's, I guess, nearly 40% of kids um, uh, live below the poverty line. You know, in places like the South Bronx, you could be 90%. You know, it could be communities where the non-marital birth rate is 85%. You know, just very different settings. And so wherever you go to become an educator, just really get to understand that community in an in-depth fashion, you know? Um, even if you're from there, because being an educator uh, even if you grow up in a certain area, there's still things to know about the community as it is today. Um, I mean, I would certainly encourage you to go to those places of the greatest need, the urban and rural uh, locations that are desperate for great teachers. Um, uh, you know, that's, that is where the need is. I mean, yes, we need great teachers in suburbia, and, and, and there are already great teachers there, and you can have a wonderful education. And it's not that everything in the suburbs is fine and great. Um, but if you're making a choice, I would at least uh, try some of your career. That's why I was attracted to Teach for America in the early days, because they were taking some of the brightest kids in the country who said, you know what, I'm going to commit two years to teach in urban and rural districts that were suffering from shortages of teachers. And those two years often translated into five years and then seven years and eight years. So a lot of teachers actually ended up staying in these schools. Um, so A, thank you for committing a portion of your life or maybe your whole life to this because the education of our kids is um, fundamental. You know, for your own development, I think you've got to, um, you've got to be exceptional every day. <laughs> um, you've got to be excellent. You know, you have to study your subject matter. You've got to know your stuff inside and out. You've got to um, build your content knowledge. You've got to study the pedagogy. You've got to be excellent. 
there are 25 parents, or 50 parents, depending. There are 25 families that are entrusting you to educate their child to the best of their ability. That demands you have to be excellent every day. Well, one more kind of related question. Um, we'll wait for some questions. Um, many students I see are already taking notes, but I'm, I'm going to do the unthinkable and tell students, if you want to take your phones out for a second, um, you suggested earlier this afternoon a couple of books that future educators really need to read, either books or authors. Can you just give them a, a quick couple oh, of, of well, titles? One is Edie Hirsch. Uh, so how many folks have heard of Edie Hirsch? Oh, gosh. Well, okay, those three, excellent. Um, so Edie Hirsch is probably one of the greatest um, education researchers. He, in 19, even, he had a, even though he had a whole career before this, in 1987 he wrote um, the, he, the book Cultural Literacy, and then he even had a dictionary. The, the, the basic premise was that he posited that in any culture, there's a body of knowledge that is assumed. And that if you don't have access to that body of knowledge, you will forever be on the periphery of that society. And he had the audacity to say, and here it is, here's my dictionary of cultural literacy, where he literally defined the vocabulary, the terms, and he, I think he almost used like the New York Times front page uh, and other sources to say these are the things that when writers are writing, they don't go into more detail. They just assume that you know. They just assume that you know. And it's an incredible book because it's not only a book about cultural liter literacy and how you um, create a cohesive society, it's also an incredible book around building literacy because he translated cultural literacy into a foundation called Core Knowledge where he created a curriculum where he says that in the early grades, it's really important that kids build background knowledge and vocabulary because in a lot of educational circles, there's sort of a sequential process to reading where you, you um, learn to read in grades, you know, kindergarten through two or three, and then you read to learn as if you can have what we call sort of content-free um, uh, English language arts in the early years. I'm getting into too much detail, but Edie Hirsch is probably, arguably, the most influential person who talks about the importance of content knowledge, especially in the early grades, and the importance of knowledge-rich curricula. So, cultural literacy, the making of Americans um, was another one of his books. The the knowledge deficit. These are all incredible books. Edie Hirsch, read, he's a great writer as well. Um, I already mentioned God, Grades, and Graduation. That's a more recent book that talks about the connection between a personal faith commitment and improved academic outcomes. Also, we talked about the Coleman Report, which, is a, which was a study done in the mid-1960s. How many folks have heard of the Coleman Report? Wow. So schools of education need to teach about the Coleman Report. It still today remains, in my view, the most important educational research study that's ever been done in our country. Like 700,000 kids were studied in this uh, study. I think 6,000 schools, uh, thousands of teachers to answer the question, why are, there why are there disparities in educational outcomes by race, I think by religion? And it was this enormous study. And the findings were that while school mattered, family structure, home environment, peer environment were far more important than school factors like teacher quality or amount per pupil spent. Most educators don't want to hear that, right? Educators want to feel, no, 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 our schools are the most important thing. Well, the Coleman Report says something very, very different. And I feel like for the last 60 years, the education reform movement has been trying to disprove the outcomes of the Coleman Report when we keep realizing, well, actually, family structure and these other factors are far more determinant. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus on high-quality schools, but if you recognize that the role of family and some of these other factors matter more, it would change our orientation of the types of interventions that we put in place. So the, Col the Coleman Report 
find it, read it. It's it's thick, but um, again, it's one of the it's one of the seminal studies of educational research that's ever been done that most educators have never heard of. Oh, steady work, steady work, right? So that there's a when, so when I was at Harvard Business School, I took a couple of classes at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, one of which was with uh, Professor Richard Murnane, and his class was all about getting the incentives right. It was like, how do you create incentives within education that actually lead to productive behaviors? But one of the books that he had us read was called Steady Work, and it's about the history of education reform. <laughs> and steady work, it was his, you know, the, this author's very quick euphemism for the fact that we're constantly reforming um, in education without necessarily improving. But it's a very important book to read because you, you think, you know, I think many people today think that, you know, we're solving a new problem when many of the issues in education have persisted and we don't learn enough from the things that are working to implement uh, those more broadly. So that's also a great book, Steady Work. I forget who the author is, though. Well, and I'll make the shameless plug for you again that, that uh, Ian's new book, uh, Agency, will be coming out uh, shortly, both in paperback and hardback, right, on Amazon. Um, maybe it's no surprise to the students, the professor has now run overtime and left no time for student questions. If you would, as, as one of the students here, if you're interested in, uh, in asking further questions, I'm sure Ian will stick around for, for a few minutes to, to answer those. Um, so I want to say thank you again to Ian. We have um, a gift of a Centennial Institute tie and a scarf for your wife. My so wife. official, well official well CCU gear, and thank you. Uh, so thank you again so much for for coming tonight. Yeah. And, uh, it was a great discussion. Thank you. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Uh, students, those of you who are looking for the the sign-in sheets, they should be available outside now. Thanks a lot. Have a good night.